broadcasting live out of a basement in Appleton, Wisconsin. You're tuned in to Fox City's Core on WCZR Code Zero Radio. We're the show that gives you an opportunity to call in and be a part of the show. Our call in line is 920-358-0795. Core. My next guest's musical journey has encompassed a diverse range of projects, including notable bands such as The Foamers, The Prigs, Muddy Utters, Hang Ten, and his contributions to Corey Chisel's live band, among others. And excitingly, he's on the brink of unveiling his debut solo album. He'll receive a special vinyl release. I'd like to welcome Maddie Day to Fox City's Core. How are you doing, Maddie? Hi, Andy. I'm really <laughs> happy to be here and not in a ditch right now. <laughs> Well, this is this is that time of year that it's it's always a little nerve wracking when people are coming because I don't want somebody to get injured or you know in a, in a wreck coming here. But you came all the way from Green Bay today. You, you gave me the option, but uh, <laughs> yeah, powered what? through in my little Prius. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is exciting because you've been in the music scene forever, and this is your first solo release coming out. Mm-hmm. And you know, it, it, you've got two shows coming up, which we're going to talk about later. One in Green Bay, one in Appleton, so you can take care of you know the whole area you can go to one if you want or both both (laughs) (laughs) well and the the places you picked out too the tarleton in green bay is is one of the premier places to see live music up in green bay that's a great theater um actually almost bought it a couple of years ago uh it was empty for a little while but uh with my my buddy tommy burns and i we went through and we checked it out but we got cold feet and uh, decided not to not to be theater owners, probably to the benefit of Green Bay. Uh, <clears throat> Tarl has done a very good job with the with the place. Very cool guy. And then the the draw in Appleton, of course, another yeah. venue that does a lot for the the community. But- yeah, John uh, was willing to host the Appleton show, and uh, just got in there the other day to check it out. And yeah, both those places are significant for me. Um, the Tarleton used to be the West Pitcher Show. Um, played there in high school back then. Um, used to go to that place. It was kind of like an alternative movie theater when I was in high school. Um, saw some really cool movies in there. Uh, then The Draw was... Played a, a few shows at The Draw with Jay Council. And then The Prig's last show actually was one at The Draw. So significant in that regard. Yeah, and... I, I can't wait to get over your musical history. We're, we're going to try to cover all of it. You've, you've got quite a bit to cover. But first, let's talk, like, how did you get started in music? Like, how old were you? Were your parents musical? My parents always played music around the house. Uh, they, they didn't play musical instruments. But um, sorry, if my dad's listening, he, he used to play the clarinet. Uh, my mom would sing and stuff. But not like, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't thrust on me by family or anything like that. For whatever reason, I... I always wanted a guitar. My parents got me one when I was eight and I started taking lessons, kind of the the genesis from there. Playing with friends, neighborhood friends, we used to set up electric guitars on a driveway and just play loud outside. And uh, yeah, then got asked to be in my first band when I was uh, about 14. And at that point you were at least proficient enough on the guitar where you could. Yeah, that, that was actually bass. Uh, I was playing <laughs> playing bass for that. That's kind of been the story of however many uh, opportunities I've gotten where it's just a lot of a lot of bass stuff. But yeah. So then from there, did you keep that that band going from fourteen? Was it a short stint? Oh, that was. Gosh. Okay. <laughs> that band was called. Uh, that band was called Weed Commissioner. Um, settle down Willie Nelson fans it was uh, <laughs> it's a very wholesome story behind that <laughs> there's uh, apparently a city position for someone who goes around and tells people that the weeds in their sidewalks are getting too big and that's called a weed commissioner um, so that lasted about a year and a half I uh, got to do my first studio experience with that um, yeah, recording with Bob Balsley in Green Bay. Um, that was a that was a trip, you know. Headphones and playing in isolated rooms and stuff like that. That was the first time I got to do that. Was that a that was that a studio that had a name? Oh, it's a it was a little studio underneath a place that's still on Broadway called the String Instrument Repair Shop. Um, yeah, I don't know if they still record down there, but 
that was my first you know that could have been abbey road when i was 14 it was it was very significant so then throughout the the rest of your time your teenage years did you mm-hmm. bounce around on any other projects were you playing yeah. gigging out eventually i mean from that point on I, i've i've pretty much always been in a band um i uh I mean, let's let's dig in. I I started a uh, a ska band called Fat Matt Ph <laughs> Fat Matt and the Pogo Six. Uh, then there was a cover band called the Knights of Neek, which was sort of a Monty Python thing. And we would play and we were playing bars when I was a teenager. That was those are some fun times. Um, I had an indie rock emo band called Tint slash Picture Day. Changed our name want to battle the bands in high school with that um and yeah those oh dear i'm probably forgetting some of it that's yeah those are the main ones well i i think too like did did you feel when you started playing music in high school like it it gave you an identity sort of like or did it feel like it was meant to be as soon as you started doing it yeah sort of i I don't know i mean I, i i think i think by that point i'd been playing i i'd been playing instrument from such a young age where it just it always felt like just kind of natural, but uh, I don't know. I've always tried to be sort of a rangy guy to where I didn't want it to define me. But uh, it was it, it became increasingly important to me. Um, to where I went off to college to the University of Kansas, uh, thinking I was going to go to Lawrence, Kansas, and join this great indie rock scene and really kind of find my way there. Um, but yeah, it was tricky. I, I've always been this sort of tweener dude where it's like i'm not set on being a lead singer i'm not set on being a guitar player or bass player or whatever and it kind of it hurt me down there because i didn't have a reputation and it was like i was trying to meet people and you know they would ask well what do you play it's like i, I don't really know <laughs> a little bit of everything what do you need <laughs> but yeah so I, I actually did not find music that was the only time in my life where i didn't have an actual band to jam with um it was uh more important on a musical development level, just friends turning me on to different music and stuff like that. But uh, yeah, it wasn't until I moved back to Green Bay that I started Muddy Utters. That was, yeah, threw my heart and soul into that. After like two years of not being in a band, it was like, uh, if, if I'm if I get to be in another band, like this is gonna be it. I'm gonna I'm gonna throw it all into this one. <laughs> and you put out uh, releases with Muddy Utters. Mm-hmm. It- yeah, we we had three studio albums and a live album, a fourth studio album that was recorded but uh, shelved kind of indefinitely. I like uh, the name of <laughs> Muddy Utters, uh, Consolidate Your Feelings. <laughs> <laughs> but, and you were in a lot of projects that, that would often play the Fox Cities. I mean, were you connected into the scene? Well, oddly when- enough, I, Muddy Utters only played Appleton once. Um, we, we played at Maritime opening for Daikaiju, the crazy surf band. Um, and that was even like, we had, we had played with them the night before in Green Bay and then they just asked us if, if, if we would do Appleton the next night. And, uh, yeah, that was it. I don't know why, like, especially in, in retrospect, I don't know why I didn't try to get us in. I know one time we, we were talking to the guy from Cold Shot and, that's right. Through some miscommunication, where it was we had, we had just talked to him, we hadn't set anything up, and all of a sudden we're hanging out at a bar, as we were wont to do, and we were flipping through the old Entertainer newspaper, and all of a sudden we saw an ad for us playing at Cold Shot on a day that we had booked elsewhere, and we immediately called the guy and said, "We didn't confirm this man," and um, he d- did not appreciate that and said he would never book us again so i think we were kind of <laughs> like oh i guess th- we didn't know what else to do for appleton I, I only half an hour away but like at the time it, it just it wasn't on my radar I, I i don't know how else to explain it since then obviously like i i've oh gosh i don't know i mean since i started playing with appleton dudes and people i i I've maybe, maybe played more in Appleton since Green Bay, or uh, more than Green Bay, um, if you if you will, my like second act of my musical career, or something like that. <laughs> well, you've done quite a bit. It's you're, you're a, a great writer. You've got a background Thanks. in writing, and you've got a blog which you laid everything out. Your discography, which I appreciate. Hey, cool. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, there's lots of stuff here, like Picture Day. 
Yeah. <laughs> Picture Day anthology. Uh, boneless skeleton, Cedar Groove, oh, yeah. Muddy Udders, of course. We talked about that. Volks, Reagan. <laughs> uh, just lots of stuff. And do you like own copies of all of this? Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I still have everything that, that I ever put out for sure. Um, Volkswagen did not put out anything tangible. Um, but, uh, yeah, the rest I've all got. <laughs> all, and all these projects you were playing primarily bass. Mostly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, with muddy Edders, it was fun cause all three of us played multiple instruments. So we would switch around. Um, but, uh, yeah, that was so. I'd, I'd play a lot of guitar for that band too. Um, I was uh, I played in a band called the Gung Hoes for a long time as as a guitar player, and that was like, yeah, I, I definitely built up my like live guitar chops. You know, it's one. It's not like I, I've played guitar every day since I was eight or whatever, but it's like live is where you really get going, and I I owe that band for really becoming a lot a stronger of a guitar player. It's a and the Muddy Utters, of course, I, I oh, like yeah. what I've heard about heard about Muddy Utters, but then there's the Foamers as well, which yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you've got a great write up on your blog about kind of the the arc of the Foamers and how your last show you didn't announce it was your last show until it was yeah. over, and then it was like, hey, that was our last show, and Literally, that was with Travis. Yeah. Pl- yes, with Travis, yeah, uh, friend of the show, right? He's been oh, here yeah. a couple of times. Love Travis and the French Irish Coalition. Yes, great, great band. band. Um. That was, that started, so I don't know, I, I had always been, when I wasn't in a band or whatever, I'd always been writing and just, you know, for whatever reason, I was just working on my songwriting. And uh, I just got in this habit of kind of just writing regardless of what it was going to go to. You know, sometimes it would be like, oh, I'm going to try to write a song for this project or whatever. But um, I don't know, I was writing some stuff during like the peak Muddy Edders era where it was like, this seems a little bit different. Like there was something just like a bit, I don't know, brasher or there was just like a bent to it that like, I just found a bit more unique and yeah, I hit up Travis who I'd played with in a band called pushing clovers. And, uh, we always got along really well and it was exciting to just try this new thing with him and started as just a recording project, uh, where I was playing bass and guitar and singing and he was playing drums and, and recording on uh, on cassette. And uh, yeah, just like four track recording stuff. And he, it was really exciting to do, but there was never any idea that we were gonna do anything live or, or anything like that. Cause we were just recording as the two of us. And yeah, eventually you can't, I don't know, I keep trying to do this thing where you have these like strict recording projects, but it's like the, the world demands that it hit the stage in some capacity so we uh, yeah got to do the foamers live um which turned out awesome just a, a real thrill to do like to just like throw yourself into these like intense songs like that no chill to that band. <laughs> well, um, you yeah. had a, it was a two-piece yep. and then you had uh brad and yeah up doing guitar for, or brad, bass for a little while yeah brad x played yeah. a couple shows of From, uh, uh, the onions yep. last sons of krypton <laughs> yeah yeah, those were fun. I we did a couple of those, and then we had kind of taken a break, and then we came back for like some Halloween shows, and it was just like he he lives in Manitowoc, so it was sort of like I, I don't know. It, it felt it felt strange to to be like, hey, do you want to come drive to Green Bay and play for ten bucks or whatever? But yeah, yeah he has. <laughs> I've been hearing about the uh, the show at the Cold Shot he played last month. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like about a month now. Hey man, it's hard. <laughs> Well, so what's in your opinion? What's the hardest part about about grinding in a in a band in the area? Oh gosh, I mean, there's sort of live music appreciation, especially in light of COVID, is kind of it's kind of like a cult thing now, you know. Like, and it's not. I don't necessarily know if it's gonna get any bigger than what it is. Like, you might get a, a few new adherents here and there, but. Uh, I don't know just getting getting people excited to do it I, everyone uh sitting at home has the world at his or her fingertips and doordash and you know whatever it's like it's hard to compete with uh with the comforts of modern life and yeah i don't know i i, I don't know how to explain why i like live music to somebody who doesn't really care about it um maybe that's the problem maybe it needs to be better articulated well you started we'll get off the 
the band arc for a little bit. You and Sam Farrell started something called Wiss Happening. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's part of that. Yeah, that is totally about uh, Wiss Happening. It's about trying to promote the good stuff that's going on around Wisconsin. I mean, I, I started promoting just independently uh, what I was terming GB haps uh, in Green Bay for just things that were going on in Green Bay. And then Sam came to me and said, have you thought about making your own site for this? And he builds websites and he's a genius and I love working with him. So it was one more cool thing to do with my with my buddy. How long did it take you to get that off the ground? Because com is set up your, the tagline is not all the events. Just it's. it's I can't remember the, what's the tagline. Oh, so I don't mess it up. Uh, not, not not all. all the, not all the, live <laughs> events. Just the good ones. Or, <laughs> well, okay. So I I've, I've been trying to promote. I, I don't know. Call it chuck it up to like civic duty or whatever. But I have been trying to just get people out to do stuff for I don't know twelve years now in various publications in Green Bay and stuff like that. And I used to just do this totally cumulative list and I I don't know, it was just kind of not it, it wasn't really connecting with people. People didn't really know it was out there. I would spend so much time combing through every little oh, this is going on at this park or this is here's food trucks here or whatever and and it just wasn't even being utilized. So I changed it to where it's like, all right if I had time and money to do everything I wanted to do, what would I want to do? And I would just pick those things and, and put those out. So I'm not trying to be cumulative or, you know, whatever. It's just, it's pretty subjective. Well, I think you also like you have relationships with, with certain venues. So if you want to find out what's going on at, at the tracks or oh sure at yeah. the Tarleton. Yeah. I've got a couple comments here. Uh, wow. <laughs> John Wheelock says a day of, might a day, day of, of might a, day a mighty of might. day yes <laughs> thank you john <laughs> got a course through my veins now thanks buddy <laughs> this a question from the foamers which is kind of funny so obviously yes. it's probably travis it's, it, it's actually me right That's, now i <laughs> timed this out <laughs> it's uh what's your favorite meg ryan movie no he didn't uh <laughs> I don't. I couldn't name a single one. Gosh, it's not like did a somebody favorite. ask them that on the, on the French Irish show? That was. Uh, <laughs> thanks, Trav. Appreciate it, buddy. <laughs> so, do you have a favorite Meg Ryan? Movie? I don't know a single. What What was she even in? I'm totally blanking. Well, uh, Sleepless in Seattle, I think, was one of them. I and then, never saw it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Gosh. So you don't have a favorite Meg Ryan? Movie. I don't have a favorite rom com. No. Okay. Sorry, Trav. God. <laughs> so so what's happening people can check it out what's happening.com yeah it's, i mean it's it's early stages um it's been we, we kind of rolled it out right around the time where i'm really trying to get word out about the albums and stuff so it's like kind of battling for battling for time but uh yeah i anticipate i anticipate it's gonna be just kind of a cool thing um hopefully get uh some like email lists or something together I, like the biggest thing that made me want to do something like that was uh, I was off of social media for a long time during the peak of COVID and everything. And I, I still wanted to, you know, know what was going on or whatever. And I, I didn't, events were starting to happen again, but I wasn't back on social media and I was looking for what was going on. And I, the one that really drove me nuts was Stone Tumble Pilots or their current iteration played at Epic in Green Bay. And I totally missed it. And it's just like, come on, just because I'm not on Facebook, I'm not finding out. It, it really irritated me. So trying to do something that's off social media, but it'll still be using social media. So we'll see. Do you find it kind of hard to, to keep above ground as far as social, keeping up with social media? Because the attention span is so short. It went from like YouTube videos to reels to shorts. It's uh, like Yeah, it's, it's hard, but I don't know. I mean, whenever whenever bands that I follow do stuff and put put videos out there, I'm I'm always appreciative of it. I don't know how long it takes them. It takes me a very long time to come up with things, but uh, and put things out there. But uh, I, I don't know. There's only so much I'm gonna do. I I I have. I don't really even think about TikTok yet. Maybe someday. I I, I don't know. Are you on there for for this channel or anything like that? I refuse to go on You're, TikTok. Okay, yeah, it's it's <laughs> tough. I uh, I was working at an ad agency for a long time, and I had to do social media work for them, and that was kind of my crash course and all that stuff. I found TikTok pretty depressing, so I I don't know. I, I there's probably some wheat among the chaff, but 
I, I don't know. It's hard enough for me to handle the platforms that I am on, I guess. Did you get on Threads when that started? No, I, I haven't. I haven't messed with that yet. I, yeah, I'm still on Twitter. I, yeah, it's still like the place where news breaks and everything like that. So, so with your journalism background, was there ever a point where you thought maybe you would put the band stuff to the side and just pursue journalism full time? I don't know. I mean, I never really got to a point where I thought about doing music full time and. I don't know if I could ever really convince myself that that were the case or like, you know, even if it happened now, somehow it's just like, I don't know. I, I live in the Midwest. I've got a wife and a house and five wonderful kids. It's like, I can't, I can't think in terms of like doing, doing music full time, all that realistically, but I'm open to thinking about it unrealistically. Uh, <laughs> journalism and stuff, I, I don't know. I, I got into, I, I studied that for a little bit in college and I, I got a bit dismayed with it kind of on principle. I was very naive and I like to say that, you know, like I, I learned that if I wrote this expose on like Cheetos <laughs> and then Cheetos or Frito-Lay sponsored my newspaper that my article wouldn't run and it's like, kidding me man you're, you're subjecting people to cheetos we have a chance to stop this thing <laughs> and it still wouldn't run so pivoting back to the bands so the foamers Can we talk about cheetos more come on <laughs> <laughs> foamers muddy udders you definitely had a sense of style in those bands which carried over to your work with the prigs oh right on and even all the times i've seen you play with Corey chisel your style game is always top notch <laughs> thanks i credit my wife with that i yeah she's just i don't know she had a bunch of cool clothes and we just we almost i mean especially with five kids we shop at thrift stores a lot so yeah whenever we're out if we just see something wild or whatever and then like the coolest thing is people just start to see they recognize like oh you like kind of different stuff why don't or I, I i've got the shirt and like people like find things for me which is like incredible um but yeah meanwhile i uh <laughs> i'm rocking this today this is actually <laughs> this is uh i've only worn this a couple of times i never owned a black suit of all of my weird clothes i never owned a black suit until uh the cover album shot for my solo album and uh that was the first time i wore this i've only worn this now since uh for for promo stuff for the album and then also to play with wayne newton <laughs> yeah so, so we can, we can jump back. i'm not, not going to take it off until the shows <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll jump ahead and talk about wayne newton i was going to wait but we'll talk about oh, it that's now fine. Yeah. so recently you and sam and alex had the opportunity to play with wayne newton at yeah. a casino which yeah tell me about that experience well like most of my coolest uh musical experiences it's very much uh credit goes to alex drosser i mean that guy has i mean for what Such he did for the prigs he got me into jay council with like pretty much out an audition um and then from there it was playing with Corey and just however many shows that we've done backing people up um i owe alex for he's all so of talented it. such a, yeah, a he's good great. musician yeah he's 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 an all right guy <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah, he had played for Wayne. Uh, and now I, I would call him Wayne because I tried to call him Mr. Newton and he didn't, he said, it's just Wayne. Um, he, he had played for Wayne six years ago and then asked uh, this, this time around when he came back, he, they also needed a guitar player and a bass player. So yeah, I mean, him and uh, Alex and Sam and I talk almost every day. And then all of a sudden our little chat had a Wayne Newton offer in there and you know, it was more about the experience than the payday or anything like that. But what an experience, man. It was it was so, so cool. I mean, just surreal to be up there, it's like playing Donka Shane with the dude and to meet him. And he was just so nice to us. And yeah, and then it, I, of, of the three of us, I was the only one who got tasked with a bass solo. Like it was written into the, the sound. I never do bass solos, man. I'm not a fan. But what do you do? Are you going to say no to Wayne Newton? So, uh, yeah. I, I did one and in rehearsal I played it just sitting down we were all just seated and then he told me uh, that I should stand up and be a star <laughs> during the bass solo so I uh, yeah 
I got to do that. That was pretty darn thrilling, man. That whole that whole show was just super cool, and my folks made it out for that. And uh, I my my grandma passed away this year and uh she at least knew that i was going to do it so it was just kind of cool that like you know there aren't that many people out there where you can say hey i'm playing for so and so and different generations will know who it even is so was it hard learning all those way newton songs because i'm sure you didn't have those already in your repertoire no i i I mean i I did a kind of a crash course on the guy because i at first when like admittedly when alex asked about it we were you know, kind of like, oh, whoa, oh, that's funny and surreal, whatever. But I, I did, like, I dove into the guy's career a bit more. I just wanted to make sure I was appreciating as much as I ought to. And, uh, yeah, uh, cool songs. Like, I had no idea he was such a, he was like this child prodigy and all these different instruments. I had no idea, just I had no appreciation for how good of a singer or entertainer he was. I walked away a fan, man, from the whole thing. Like, it was, yeah, it was cool. And, uh learning the songs then i did not know them like even doc shane other than that lyric it's like i don't i didn't really know the song um so yeah spent some time working on that we, we got the charts a couple weeks or like a week and a half ahead of time and uh, i don't really read music uh, i haven't since i was since i played bass in middle school jazz band um so it was a trip to get back into that uh pretty darn humbling uh, another opportunity that alex kind of put out there was he plays in big mouth and they were looking for another guitar player and i was thinking about that but man I'll, to read those charts it was just the wayne newton experience kind of sealed it where it's just like dude you're you're not really much of a chart reader at, at least at this point but yeah it the the show turned out pretty darn well that was pretty cool to see you guys doing that and the picture oh, that, dude. <laughs> that surfaced was pretty awesome yeah like, yeah and his, he let us come get a picture with him in his dressing room after the show it's pretty sweet sweet guy smells great <laughs> uh, last year you did a uh, it was a sort of it was a celebration of life show mm-hmm. uh, for ryan from the, the prigs now that was a project that that you re- wrote about quite extensively on your blog oh thanks for reading that yeah and that you guys put out an album you played at the Timber Rattler Stadium. You did a lot of stuff in that band, and then it just sort of stopped. Yeah. Was it hard to, to revisit? And I know Sam stepped in and, and did Ryan's part for that yeah, show, but was it hard absolutely. to revisit that stuff? Um, I mean, I, I don't spend a lot of time going back and listening to my old stuff, not out of principle or anything, but yeah, I... I hadn't listened to that music in the years since we stopped playing together. And yeah, I listening to that album again, it was, uh, I, I was shocked how much I enjoyed it. Um, it was cool. My, my kids were listening to it all the time and, uh, yeah, I would just come downstairs and they would have it on in their little playroom. And it was, it was cool to hear it. Um, and then to actually do the songs, uh, it was it was funny. It, the songs actually felt really good to play live. Maybe even better. Just in ter- it was there was a shocking amount of like hard earned muscle memory that somehow had endured, and to play the songs almost felt like a, a bit. I don't want to say easier. I don't know. It, it was just it was it didn't feel quite like I felt it. The songs felt a bit more alive than I thought. Then rather than like a you know becoming like the world's worst tribute band or something like that. You know? It's interesting, I think, because you step back from something you worked on that you're listening to, you're playing all the time, and then you go back to it, it's almost like you're listening to it as a, a music fan, in a yeah, way. So kinda, it's, yeah, kind of, yeah. I don't know if you had a, you said a different appreciation for it, but it... Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I mean, maybe part of the reason I'm not naturally inclined to listen to my old stuff is like, I feel like what I keep doing gets better and I don't necessarily want to dwell on old mistakes or, you know, you listen to something and go, man, I wish I would have done that different. That was a stupid lyric or whatever. But like, um, yeah, I, I was I like just trying to listen to it just to relearn the songs and everything. It was like, yeah, I, I, I enjoyed it. I'm not ashamed to say that. Well, lots of great <laughs> harmonies in the prigs. Yeah, that was really fun. That was the first time we ever really got to really got to mess with that. And, yeah, just loved doing that stuff. Super hard to do live, but we would do some practices where it would really just be typically like Tony playing acoustic guitar and then 
the five of us trying to just do like harmony practice and yeah i'd never been in a band like that i loved putting that work in though you guys did some promo work at the refuge i remember some some videos (laughs) popping up (laughs) yeah that was a pretty silly band and that was recorded by sam oh yeah Sam. you did that at the refuge yeah um alex again set that up and i mean i've been neglecting to mention like yeah just Corey. like this was Corey is really at like the heart of just about all the music i've gotten to do were you playing with Corey before the prigs no no i i didn't really know Corey all that well the the prigs had started i i'd I'd hung out with him a couple times um but like musically it had never had never really done anything but i i think that was kind of a cool way for he and i to get to know each other because he was at the refuge all the time back then and um yeah i mean he basically agreed to let us do the album there and we were we were set to do it on our own on like a digital board that tony had and we had started doing that but i mean yeah sam is is incredible and yeah i that that process went on a little bit longer than i think any of us anticipated but uh i think we're all super glad that we did it and then how was it playing at the timber Rattler stadium oh that was such a thrill man i like well (laughs) i mean yeah that was that was a cool day because it was uh the bodines the prigs and Corey chisel am i missing anybody adriel and adriel. jay council yep so alex and i played with four acts that day sam was with three and it was it was a long day um yeah that's right i, I actually i got sick that morning and just went <laughs> through it but i i had so much fun with it because it was like we're playing in a stadium like are you kidding me i did corny stuff like let me hear some noise over here (laughs) whatever (laughs) i couldn't resist (laughs) so do you have a favorite show that you played with Corey? because you've done a lot of different places with with Corey's band oh gosh there were just there was like there was a really cool era where we had just all gotten really good at the songs and just really good friends and everything like that so we would do these shows with Jay Council, Adriel, and Corey, and it was just kind of like this, like family band type thing where, pretty much like everybody would be on stage the whole time, but we would just shout out which songs we were gonna do, and there were a couple of those that were just super special moments where it just felt like we were the best conglomerate out there, and um, I, I can't, I couldn't really pick one, but there was there was a, there was the one time where we we did that at. Uh, the cruddy barn in spring green um <laughs> thank you where, sure <laughs> my kids are watching too hi kids <laughs> and uh that was where ryan seafeld couldn't make it it was on a like a thursday or a wednesday or something like that and he was having a hard time getting out of work but the opener was the jimmy chamberlain experience oh, yeah. and yeah so jimmy chamberlain just played drums with us and that was unbelievably cool and he was so good like it was just yeah he he didn't for him to like for he i mean him playing on jay council songs that he'd never heard before and just sitting in and just yeah jimmy's the drummer for the smashing pumpkins if people aren't aware of that so that's 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 pretty cool that was neat yeah Yeah, that was really neat so then you're still in Corey's band if he if he needs you right i know yeah he played at he Cranky did a Pat's. crazy Pat's show yeah. that was Robert Ellis. I think Alex wound up getting pulled on stage for that, but it was yeah, it was impromptu. It was, yeah. So that that brings us to your solo album, which we, we've been building up to this point. So <laughs> <laughs> so around March of 2021 is where you first yeah you've been, you've been quoted as saying that's when you the idea first <laughs> popped up in your head to do the solo album. Sources say. Sources say. <laughs> I mean, and you've you've had input in other bands, Muddy Utters, you know different bands but this was going to be the first project that carried your name yeah yeah i I was just trying to think of like when it actually dawned on me to give this a shot but i mean during while there were there was there were no shows going on because of covid going into that i was already very burnt out 2019 was a really heavy gigging year for me and in like January of 2020, I remember I, I'd gotten like this full slate of shows to play that summer. And I remember just looking at it and going, I, I couldn't be less excited about doing this. And I was thinking about hanging it up as it was. And then, you know, it was hung up for me and all of us on account of COVID. Um, but yeah, I, 
I, I really, I really like got away from music during that time. I relished not having to gig. I didn't miss it at all. People would be talking about how they're pining for like live music again. And I was just like, I don't know. I was maybe even regretful at the time, but still just moving on, uh, that I had spent all this time on music and yeah, I was working as a painter, a uh, house painter at the time, which were, that, those were long days. It was long commutes. It was kind of a solitary gig. And I would just listen to podcasts and books and stuff, anything but music. And, uh, man, I, I was, I was feeling so done with it. I, I just, I didn't play anything for a while. I, whatever records my kids would put on, that would be, that'd be it for me. And, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, it kind of dawned on me where I, I still had a bunch of songs that I had written that had never been put out with any bands and or ideas for songs and i just thought okay you're just really gonna let those just rot on the vine then huh like that's it and um i don't know i was kind of coming to terms with that and ready to do that actually but i was trying to think of when i came up with the name it was like i came up with the name and it just gave me like this whole idea of what i could try to do uh, I, I think it was I was listening to some podcast or other and a British guy said the word metadata but the way he said it in his British accent was metadata and I was like, <laughs> I was like oh that's so funny and there are all these different ways you could go with it and it kind of sounds like my name etc and I just started thinking like, well that's like a weird enough and like open enough of a name where I could kind of just make it be whatever I want and put all these different songs on there and just started thinking dude you know all these people that you've played music with you could probably start calling in some favors and things like that you know i've been a side man in however many bands and just been around for a, like a, a long enough time to where it's like i just thought i could just start asking people um yeah i started working on that i, I think I, I took about five months or so before I, I came to Sam and Alex about that, because that was the other thing where those guys had been recording a ton. They were doing all sorts of cool stuff during COVID times. And um, they, I'm just thinking like, gosh, like two of my best friends are these like incredible producers. Why wouldn't I go to them and just see if they would do me the solid? Um, yeah. And uh, part of that too, I just, I, uh, I did some house painting for Sam as just a bit of pre-barter. Um, granted, I've probably well eclipsed what I <laughs> the value I gave him there in terms of studio time, but um, yeah, uh, just started working on it, and yeah, we actually it, it took it took a while for me to start getting the songs together, like getting the vision together, and then we started recording. Uh, it was it was <laughs> it was April twentieth, twenty twenty two. That was the first session. So you went into it knowing that you wanted to do like 10 10 to 12 songs i had the fulls i had the track list like i, I came up with that before um, the songs were even written very few of them were finished um so it was like the way that we would do this i, I knew what i wanted <laughs> yeah i knew i knew like what i wanted it to be and even if some of those places on the potential track list were just like a, a description of what the sound was going to be um i knew what i what i wanted it to be but yeah largely uh, I would start the way we recorded it is we would start one song at a time. We did it sequentially. I've never done an album like this before where you just start on one song and then work on it till it's done. And then the next one we did it, we would do track one and then track two, hmm. but rarely, rarely, rarely did I have much beyond maybe I know a chorus or I know a guitar part or something like that. So, um, although some of the ideas of these songs go back maybe even 15 years and something like that for stuff I haven't used, the songs themselves did not come together until usually maybe the night before we recorded or something like that. I mean, I'd be working on my lunch break, just like scribbling away and editing lyrics and stuff like that. And yeah, so it was exciting for it to come together. And I, I, I think that's why there are just a couple of things that the way that it came together, it, it sounds weird to say spontaneously because it took us a year and a half to get through it all, but it wasn't like that was spent doing take after take and, and re-editing and, and whatnot. I, most of the takes on there are first or second takes. It's just a matter of when we actually worked on stuff. So, and, and a lot of times I'd, I'd get in and 
I know how the song was supposed to go. I know all the lyrics. I know the guitar part, maybe a lead guitar idea or something like that. And then I would completely forget, oh yeah, I have no idea what I want to do on bass. And then I would basically be making that up while playing. So there's just, and, and then the guest musicians on it would be playing, playing the song for the first or second time. Maybe they heard it, my lousy demo earlier <laughs> that day for the first time. And I don't know, it makes it feel kind of alive because it's, it's it's largely us if it feels it, it's like a lot of the people on it hearing it for the first time or you know i've never maybe wrote the lyrics i never sang them out loud before and you know, literally wrote them like during my lunch break at work that day and then then there's a microphone in front of me and i'm recording for prosperity <laughs> did it, as far as like the the writing process goes so you worked on a song by song was there ever a point where you thought i hope alex and sam keep interested in this because if they decide to drop off the whole thing's oh, dead in the water well i mean we kept up vibes like immaculately I, I mean truly it was a chance to hang out with my dudes an extra day of the week like we would typically do wednesdays so we, we didn't we didn't let it mess with our weekends so sometimes i would see them on weekends anyway and it would just be an extra i, I love those guys i love hanging out with them so it was yeah and my my contribution would i would bring stuff to drink stuff to eat you know take guys out to dinner or a tom cruise movie or whatever <laughs> how much input did sam and uh alex have in it because alex is quoted as saying that you would send him some some stuff and then they sure. would make sense out of it so did they have a, a strong part did you give them create a creative license to expand on your ideas well i mean a huge part of it is just i trust those guys with anything like that's the basis of the album is just i i felt great bringing ideas that weren't set but that was also a bit by design too where i didn't done this thing before we, we call this phenomenon demo itis where you record a demo and then you just you listen to it and you listen to it and then you start to fall in love with it and then before you know it when you go into the studio to do the real version you are just trying to replicate whatever happy accidents happen on the demo and i, I i've been so disappointed by that in the past to where I just, I was not going to let it happen. I would, I would literally, rec I would intentionally record super poor quality demos <laughs> where it would just be me playing an unplugged electric guitar into a laptop microphone and just doing a couple tracks of it on GarageBand or whatever, just to, just to give them an idea. Cause I found that to be helpful. And so they, you know, I could say, Oh, it sounds like the association or whoever. And, they would have an idea but you know it, it's it, it helps to have at least my lousy little demos maybe maybe for like the 20th anniversary vinyl there'll be like an extra <laughs> <laughs> well so you're getting it on vinyl which is great and, yeah and i'm hoping to have one to hold up today <laughs> but i'm gonna have to yeah we'll are, see are you doing any cds or just just vinyl i think i'm just doing vinyl i mean it maybe I, I can't imagine people are going to come to me and say i i really wish you had done this on cd um <laughs> it just doesn't really happen there's just kind of it's it's kind of just divergent now where there's a vinyl camp and an, a streaming camp so it's gonna cater to both of those and you you yeah. had it mastered by justin perkins at oh, yeah. the mystery room justin's yeah. amazing yeah, I loved his episode on here, by the way. That was uh, nice work. Um, I had gotten to record a full album with him, with Muddy Utters. Of, that was, we did that in 2009. And yeah, loved working with him. He then mastered, he mastered Muddy Utters' second album, Cream City, and then our third album. Uh, so he, he did everything for our second album, Cream City. And then he mastered... Uh, the third one, Bloody Murders, which is my favorite. Um, and even with that, like I, I got to spend a little extra time with him. Like I got to go in, and there was one guitar part that I had forgotten to do when we tracked that, and he let me do that in his studio. And um, he's just been he's been super helpful. I yeah, that guy means the world. And, and for anybody who's ever worked with him, you know, if you have any kind of questions, he'll write back within like 20 minutes, just this essay for you and. Yeah, incredible guy. And especially doing vinyl for the first time. Um, the Foamers had been put out on vinyl, but the record label that did that did everything. So I didn't have to, I was blissfully unaware of the rigors of going through the vinyl process. And yeah, this time I, I took it all on and Justin was huge in 
hold my hand through that. Did you do all the artwork for the, the okay, album? Okay, so uh, Loretta McGee uh, from Amano Print House, uh, whose baby shower I'm going to this <laughs> afternoon, um, she uh, she took the picture. We did that at the PAC. Um, got in there because our family friend, Gerald Hen- Henley, is, uh, is one of the events he's kind of like top events dog there um and he's yeah, he's also retiring in the next year so i think he was game for us to get in and do <laughs> something stupid but i i didn't even thought about it I, I always had it in the back of my head that i'm, I'm gonna do this at the pac of course i am and then i, I remembered at one point i was gonna have to actually ask him <laughs> and thankfully he said yes and i hadn't thought about this either but they don't do shows in the summertime so we were able to get in there in summer to do that um at one point I got locked out of the building when everyone else was on stage waiting for me and outside sweltering in the heat in this and just hello <laughs> but yeah Loretta took the pictures for that uh, which was awesome she's done a bunch of Hang 10 video shoots and just loved working with her so it seemed like the, the most just ideal person to work with for that uh, and then my friend Jake Phelps did the design stuff. Jake had also done the cover design for the Foamers record. And uh, he's just been a good friend of mine for a long time and just super talented design guy, super talented musician too. Is it going to be a, a gatefold or a, just a, oh, a single, single jacket? Sleep? Nice. Yeah, man. Oh, wow. Gatefold. I can't even imagine how expensive it's, it's that like would be. It's like buying a car with all the different options. Dude, oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> Well, we, we had a question here from Bob Minter. Does song idea surface at 3 a.m., and does that drive you crazy the next day? It happened to me last night. Uh, trying to fall asleep, and I, I don't know. I come up with a number of ideas just in that magic little twilight time of just going off to sleep, like some kind of melody. I'll almost start dreaming it. And if I have the good sense, I'll kind of notice it and if I have the even better sense, I'll actually get out of bed and do something, like record it. And yeah, I did that last night. That happened. I mean, and I was so close to just being like, no, I got to get up and drive in the snow to Appleton. I, I got to just just go to bed, dude. You'll remember it tomorrow. And that's like, that's a death wish for that idea right there. <laughs> Thank you for the question, Bob. Thanks, Bob. You have a music video that... Frank Anderson was working on it. Frank Anderson, another guy in the Appleton music scene. Holy cats. I mean, they, Frank Anderson yeah. rocks. <laughs> Frank Anderson rocks like nobody rocks. <laughs> I love Frank Anderson. So, uh, I have not seen it. I, we, we shot it. Uh, I trust Frank implicitly. Um, I may see it when everybody else sees it for the first time. So, yeah. Frank is quoted as saying, he's on the record as saying that it will be done by yeah. the album oh, release no no <laughs> worries on that whatsoever yeah can you tell us about the video because you you posted some some still shots where you're in the studio oh yeah you've got your arms up in the air gosh my pr people need to really tamp this stuff <laughs> down <laughs> um there's there's not i don't know I, I i don't think i'm gonna say much about it it'll be uh it'll be just as frank says it was oh you're making us wait um yeah man <laughs> Oh, oh wow <laughs> Prince of Love. Is, there you go I'll let that uh, yeah refresh yeah. your memory a I'm, little bit uh, I'm invoking the spirits that's uh, yeah <laughs> <laughs> so the video it will be you obviously doing that <laughs> <laughs> yes whatever else did you give Frank creative he had the vision of- entirely he knew okay. exactly what he wanted to do and then uh, Oliver, his son, helped with the shoot. Both of those um, guys are just re- yeah. Oliver's um, another talented just, like film. Uh, Oliver's another just one of my favorite people in the world, and he is actually okay. How about this? Uh, <laughs> I won't talk. I won't tell you about the videos. I'll tell you that there will there are there are three videos coming out. Three videos. Um, so Frank's Oliver did one, and uh, also Ridley Tankersley from Dusk. And are you going to stagger the release of these videos, or are you going to just dump them all out on album release weekend? That. The latter. Oh, nice. Good. Yeah. None of this. How do you feel about when like a, a venue or place will say, big announcement tomorrow? Like You know what I mean? Like You'll, mm. you'll see the picture, big announcement coming tomorrow, big announcement 
stay tuned next week. I kind of roll my eyes at it. It's like <laughs> I I happen to see this scrolling right now, but am I going to happen to right? You know, by the by the time I wake up tomorrow, I'll have totally forgotten it. You know. <laughs> so that was you, you didn't really say if you what you thought of that. You just <laughs> oh, I don't, I, I, I don't. I said well, I said I roll my eyes oh, at it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you, like, you did. Oh wow, I can't wait, man. Like <laughs> you did a. a I've, though then there, here's me doing all I know I haven't done any of that you, you for have the not promo. done that okay but right. I just say your promo video was really good thank you you're, you're wearing that outfit yeah not you're in the woods <laughs> like, yes. did you have a do you have a background in theater because your theater voice in that promo <laughs> really good. never I've never done anything like uh well my I took okay I was a I was a, a an English and film a double major in English and film in college and then uh part of that entailed a single acting class uh and then gosh in high school um do you know like comedy city comedy sports like that kind of improv yeah my friends and i used to go to they had like a teen group of that and we would we would go to that so like i've been everything i've ever learned was from the that one acting class and then my teenage improv training which i wasn't that good at it back then were you, were you pretty much making that up on the spot oh of course not <laughs> okay. uh, yeah i just opened my mouth and elucidate no um no that was just like uh that was produced by my other good friend tommy burns i, I everything that i'm doing is like you know these these guys who i i'm I'm working they're i'm very inspired by my friends they're just super talented super fun to work with so sometimes it's just a matter of i'm gonna come up with this to uh get to do something with this person and tommy i've worked on we have a packers show called live from stadium drive and yeah he and i are very very comfortable working together we were roommates together living on stadium drive and yeah you guys did live from stadium drive for a while then you stopped mm-hmm. doing it and then you had like a surprise episode then you stopped doing it again. <laughs> is, is that going to come back now that the packers well, are in the playoffs maybe hopefully longer than oh yeah tomorrow? i mean i think there's always it we could we could have an idea that would spring it and just be like dude we have to shoot tomorrow but yeah i mean we we were doing it weekly for several seasons um and then we both moved out of that house. So then we had to come up with a different studio setup and then a different studio setup. So we uh, love doing it and love the Packers. Uh, but yeah, that's, it's really hard to do. Like it's, it's, it's hard to make time to like those, uh, it, what like what do they say like it costs a lot of money to look this cheap like you know, <laughs> it takes a lot of thinking to to come off like bumbling packer fans basically <laughs> so when you were living over there were you also attending a lot of packer games oh my gosh dude i couldn't not because it was literally my backyard like I, the lambeau field parking lot was my backyard we rented this house for i i paid very cheap rent um we were the only full-time tenants like the rest of the houses for the first six houses on the block were all these rented out party houses and stuff um but yeah i mean we're so close to the stadium there was i i think i missed i I missed very few games even if it just that like kickoff would come up and i would just walk out to like where the scalpers used to be and rest in peace paper tickets i really miss that but um I would I would just go by myself just because if I were watching the game on my couch, say it's like third and goal from the one, and all of a sudden you know I'm watching the the snap on TV, I would hear the reaction behind me because I live so close where I just toss the remote. Well, guess I didn't get it, you know. (laughs) See, I love. I mean, again, I just I love live entertainment. That's uh, memories happen outside of the house. This is kind of related to live entertainment. Uh, recently it was announced that there's something in the Bay Area called the Bammies. Yeah. Which you're on the board of. I am, yeah. So tell me about the Bammies. How did you get I'm, involved with that? And what is it if people haven't heard of it yet? I'd love to tell you more. I don't know a great deal about it yet. I'll just say I'm I, like the people that are so, on the committee are including my friend Jake Phelps, but there's also Tom, Tom Smith, Smith, Tom Johnson, Frank Hermans. All um, people that are huge in the, in the area as yeah, far as local music. Yeah, and, it was kind of like, hey, cool, man. I, that's nice of you to include me on this. And um, I mean, it stands for the Bay Area Music. Yeah, uh, music awards. Mm, you know, or like basically, awards. yeah. 
<laughs> I don't, I'll just what I, I what I would say about it is uh, I don't I don't know much about the whammies. I've never been to one. Jay Council got one as best new artist. That was the only time I've ever been part of any kind of nomination or award or anything like that. Um, and I was just kind of peripheral in that. But I don't know. I see a lot of people complain about the whammies. So it's like, I hope maybe. I think it's cool <laughs> that somebody else uh, is, is doing something about it rather than just complaining or whatever but i don't know I, I i think it's i think it's a fun thing i think it'll be a good time i don't know if i'm gonna be eligible for anything since i'm on the committee but <laughs> well so they've got nominations yeah. open right now you can go to the the bammy website and mm -hmm. go through the nomination process you can nominate your favorite band they've got to be from the the bay area obviously yeah so basically northern wisconsin or because i think it goes all the way up to like door county and stuff like that too um yeah I think it's great because the Madison's got the the Mamas, I think. Oh, the Madison do they? area music. Okay. So in the Whammies is let's face it, a lot of the people on the board are from Milwaukee, you know, sure. that area. So that's where you hear that a lot of the complaining is that, well, it's you know, they overlooked oh this. But I, I think they tried to know, break that. They've got a pretty tough job. Oh, man. That's, that's huge. Like it's no matter what, somebody yeah. would complain. <laughs> so. No, totally. But that's great. So the the Bammies, and the, I think that's going to be at the Tarleton as well. Uh, yeah. So that's yeah. that's pretty cool. Which, getting back to your show, so Friday, January twenty sixth is the first show, and mm -hmm. that's going to be at the Tarleton in Green Bay. And then the next day, January twenty seventh, which is a Saturday, so Friday and Saturday, that one will be at the Draw in Appleton. Yeah. Are you planning on doing the same show each night, or is it going to be oh yeah different? Somehow? It'll be the same. I mean, it'll be a little bit tailored just on account of the space because the Tarleton is just a bigger stage than we're going to have at the draw, which could make for some fun just distinctions. The but, Tarleton, uh, let's talk about that that space again. Like they've got yeah. the old the old fashioned booths that you can sit in. They've yeah. got a real like... Yeah, it's... Again, he did a great job of it. Part of what we were... When Tommy and I went through there and looked at it, it was like... It wasn't at the time the West Pitcher show as I had remembered it because it had been owned by former Packer Nick Barnett. Oh, Nick Barnett. <laughs> former, former Packer, current Samurai. Um, he uh, had it as Club 5-6 Ultra Lounge, which is something that I referenced in a Muddy Utters song. Um, but then uh, from there, that, that didn't go over so hot for whatever reason. And then it was owned by some lighting computer slash store it was it was really it was it was called the funky monkey and it was like <laughs> they used the whole theater as like this place to display their party lights I, I never went in there it was just it was totally just by the time we got to see it it was kind of it was coming off like this like frankenstein of the three previous iterations and it yeah so credit to tarl he took that place and just kind of made it like as cool as it could possibly be i, I think it feels great in that place it, do you feel there's a, a big difference between the green bay and the fox cities music scene i think green bay has been kind of overlooked in the past because of things like mile of music but they've got oh, lots sure. of great events up there like the the I can't remember the the name. It's a boat something, or they've got it's like a little festival. Oh, oh, um, yeah, all bands on deck. Yeah, that's <laughs> yeah, um, that's also a Tarl brainchild. Uh, well, I I never really again, like, you know, with Muddy Utters not playing in Appleton, it just like it wasn't. I, I wasn't really aware of what was going on. I remember seeing an article about Corey Chisel in the Press Gazette at some point, and and I remember thinking, how is this huge artist in Appleton? And I had never heard of him. It's just so, it's really funny. I don't know. I I hope I've been some sort of an example for bridging the supposed gap or whatever, <laughs> where it's just yeah, I'm doing both. That's part of why I wanted to do a show in Green Bay and Appleton for the release shows. But uh, I don't know. I mean, Green Bay has the history of the Concert Cafe. And before that, there were, you know, before my time, there were places like Kutzka's Hall and stuff like that. Lefties, um, you have fun with Adams from there, uh, who recorded with Butch Vig at uh, Smart Studios. And um, yeah, I, I don't know. Green Bay always felt plenty big enough for me i was in high school during the concert cafe stuff and i went there a few times i got to play there once um 
got to know Tom Smith, who's just like a larger than life guy for me. And actually, um, he was, uh, my wife and I met at a show that he booked and then we had him ordained and he was our, our minister when we got married. I bought him a nice white tuxedo. He looked <laughs> impeccable. Um, so yeah, I mean, between like Tom Smith and Rev Norb, like, it always just felt like there were just these larger than life people there. It never felt like I needed to go elsewhere. You know, I, I lived in Milwaukee for a number of years too, so I appreciate that scene too. But even that scene, it's a lot of Green Bay expats. It's funny. Um, but yeah, I, I, I never really, I, I remember thinking even the lyric room was such a special venue that i took me forever to actually appreciate maybe like two months before it closed i finally said you know what i really like this place <laughs> um and will the owner former owner was a great friend of mine uh but i remember thinking appleton didn't have a spot like that like that was like a really special room like just this shotgun room where i don't know it just it, it just the, the kinds of bands that would play in green bay I don't really think they had a, an equivalent place like that. And, you know, now you maybe have at the tracks in Green Bay. Um, but yeah, I, I think, I, I don't know. I would, would, am I, am I, am I overlooking stuff or what? No, I what think you... that's, that's a fair assessment. Like, cool. It's, I mean, I, I love, uh, I love misfits here in Appleton, but like, again, it's not like a stage. So like, that's what lyric room kind of had. And I just, in general, I, I've, if I had to chalk up, like if I had to assess, uh, <laughs> the the two music scenes appleton i would say is is appreciative or attentive um i know a guy like kurt gunn was playing around green bay for a long time and it wasn't until he started playing in appleton where people started paying attention to his songs and i think that was like a huge just shot of life for his music career and everything and i love that um green bay is uh its strength is it's it's a bit uh, it's a bit surlier. It's a bit uh, <laughs> uninhibited. It's uh, yeah. I forgot there was like, like the Crunchy Frog was there for a while. Oh too. yeah, and man. Yes, yeah. A lot of places that closed. Like, yeah, you mentioned yeah. The Sadly, lyric yeah. room, but yeah. yeah. Um, Frets and Friends uh, on the east side is still just one of the great places. That yeah, that's like where that was kind of a home base for Muddy Utters and those. That place uh, it used to be IQs before that. That has hosted some of the most fun experiences i've ever had playing music i love that building still got a few more pictures i'm gonna throw your way here just before right. it's too late. <laughs> probably probably should have sent some of those over prior but oh, uh, got the wayne newton picture in there <laughs> yes <laughs> awesome did you do you just take the one picture or did you take a couple just in case this one doesn't turn out i think we maybe snapped three but they were nice. pretty much identical um i think that's a strength wayne has going for him um Prigs at the Fox City Stadium. Yeah, that was cool. It's still most of those off your blog. Oh, right on. <laughs> hey, Foamer's down at the Reptile Palace. Reptile Palace is another just glorious place, man. I, I. Any yeah. chance you'll do something with Travis in the future? I am doing something with Travis presently. Uh, he and I have a country band. We we started a classic country cover band called Country Holla. I think I heard of that. Didn't yeah. you guys play? You played up on the roof of a brewery, I think. We did one show at uh, for the All Bands on Deck uh, in in September, and I don't know. It was just kind of cool. Like, I Steve Gala, the singer for that, is a good friend of mine, and he and I were in a band together. I was I was kind of a hired gun guitar player in this rockabilly band called the Blowtorches, which was a blast. But it was kind of just like a last run of shows for them, and we wanted to still do something. And meanwhile, the Foamers were kind of talking about shutting down and travis also is is a like old country freak and so is steve and so am i it's where it was just like we were just kind of assessing the landscape of what's out there and there aren't there are bands that play modern country contemporary stuff but nobody's out there doing like there aren't bands out there we, we're basically going to focus on like 60s to 90s or maybe even 50s to 90s so yeah is it, is it going to be hard not to whip out some foamers tunes when you guys are playing no way we're we're disciplined country <laughs> musicians <laughs> a bunch of people are there yelling out foamer song titles you're not gonna <laughs> oblige <laughs> i don't think I, I think even at our own shows people weren't yelling out our own songs but <laughs> oh here's okay here's one with us with brad x that was at 
was it Rockabilly's or was it Gasoline at the time? Same building. Now that's at the tracks. Um, ooh, Hang 10 photo shoot shot yeah, by we Loretta even, McGee. We're going to have to talk about Hang 10. Right on. Yeah, we were just working on a new song. Love those dudes. And, oh, Jason Birkin, Bob Dylan's guitar tech, taking my uh, my guitar apart. Okay, so that's good, apart. because those are two questions I almost forgot about. Let's talk about the bass first. So you play oh, sure. unique bass. The first time I saw it, I thought it was like a Hoffner, but it's not. Never. Like, where, where did you get that bass? That's a Hoffner. Uh, Craigslist. <laughs> <laughs> no, I... Gosh. I mean, is it like, what What brand is it? I was really afraid you were going to ask. I well, you don't have don't, to. If no, you don't know, I don't. Great. Like, I don't remember. So, Somebody asked me like a while ago and I knew when I first got it because it doesn't have any, doesn't have anything on it. I remember I looked up the serial number and figured it out at one point. But yeah, it's a late 60s hollow body. Um, I just, I hadn't bought a bass since I was... 15 so i just i thought okay i'm gonna spend it cost me 150 bucks on craigslist got it set up a little bit um yeah jason working on it here was just a time where i, I hadn't played it over winter and just the action was like the strings were like two inches from the neck so well it seems like it's really light oh yeah it, so yeah. i'm sure you've adding, got to keep adding it. years to my career <laughs> <laughs> but the, okay so that the bass it you don't know what brand it is. It sounds great. You used that oh, one with sweet. the Prigs, at least when I saw you. Mm-hmm. And I think you used it with Corey as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, I used a couple with Corey. So Hang 10. Right on, yeah. So this was a band that you guys started, I think much like the Prigs, where it was, we're just going to record, and then it ended up also doing shows. Yeah. Yeah, again, it's not something that the world wants to allow. But I was not originally in the band. Uh, that was, it was originally Alex, Sam, Riley and Ryan Ike and uh yeah uh the way that Sam tells it is he was doing impressions of the way that I played bass on their <laughs> tracks anyway so then he just decided to recruit the real deal and yeah that's been that's been super fun just totally different like just just unapologetically poppy or just yeah just love it and it's it's just so fun to do those like I don't know I, as much as I had a good time doing spearheading the process for the solo project like i don't know if that's really my bag uh i really i mean i love how it turned out and everything but i love being in a band i love being a collaborator and you know like just yesterday sam sent out a demo for a song and and i got to say what about this for the bridge and recorded a little phone recording and sent it back i just like i love that i I love that part of it so yeah it's been it's been awesome you guys did a a string of shows at Milo Music. Yeah, That's yeah, it. we did get to do a couple. Of, yeah, played at McFleshman's. It's, it's a project that wasn't meant to pl- really play live, but it sounds like you're okay with it falling into the yeah the yeah. live category. I mean, it's just more than anything. We just I don't know. This is, again, this is the same thing for all bands. Like that's how it was with the Prigs, where it was like, it's going to be a recording project. Okay, we'll do live. We won't do gigs. We'll do concerts. You know, we're going to do these <laughs> special events and. Um, before you know it you're playing weddings and you know <laughs> just happens you're a fan of justin hawkins rides again which oh, yeah. i am as well really oh dude I, rides. I evangelized for that guy and i have turned on so few people <laughs> i love that show so you're a fan of the darkness as well Mega. prior to that and what other artists influence you hmm um gosh i don't know i, I go through phases i am still kind of in this just huge oasis phase or just i don't know just in general i i right now (laughs) right now my my biggest loves are 60s sunshine pop and 80s british music i thought you were gonna say 80s hair bands it was oh no no i mean like i just i I, (laughs) yeah i I love the darkness just because it's such it's just such good vibes and it's like you know people get hung up on things like is it a joke is he being serious or and i just i've never cared about that oh yeah that's no joke yeah but like like another band that i always loved is the john spencer blues explosion where it's like you know he's kind of sounding like a like crazy elvis impersonator or something and it's like it's kind of jokey but it's like i don't know does it make you feel good when you listen to it then that's kind of all that matters yeah so that's yeah, that's kind of the, I I think of the darkness in the same way. So, can we expect to hear some of those influences in your upcoming album? 
I heard the only bit I heard was that snippet at the end of the promo video. Yeah, I wanted that's more. All that's out there. Um, let's see. I actually, I didn't really know how to talk about the album because I don't. I even I thought about showing it to you beforehand, but then I just I, I kind of forgot. So here we are. Uh, so it's not this. It's not going to be heard until it comes out. I, I think the easier way was for me to come up with a list of. Uh, what the album doesn't have as opposed to what it does have so i i jotted this out this morning do i have time for this yeah all right <laughs> uh number 10 of the aspects Matty day's metadata does not have it does not have any horse sound effects uh i mentioned that because there actually was one buried in the prigs album um i don't even remember where it was but i remember we put a tiny little picture of a horse in the album art inside the CD uh, to remember that, to commemorate that. <laughs> That's number 10. Number nine, uh, no Italian language. Uh, number eight, uh, no kazoo, which is kind of a bummer in retrospect, but you know you weren't gonna force it. Uh, another instrument that's not on there is a double bass pedal. Um, there's none of that on the album. Number six of what's not on metadata, uh, Let's see, is it like, oh, that Mongolian throat singing stuff? None of that. <laughs> um, wait, no, okay. Uh, I had Gregorian <laughs> chants, but I can't say that after all. Um, number five. Yeah, number five. Uh, no, no finger tapping guitar solos. Uh, at least on the record, there may, there may be some in the music videos. <laughs> uh, number four, things not on metadata. There are none of those anthems where it's all like whoa, like none of none of that for better or for worse. Um, number three, number three. There's none of that, okay, there's none of that, like, you remember, like, new metal whispering, whisper screaming? Like, yep. there was there was a song that was going to go, let the Maddies hit the floor, but that didn't make it. Um, <laughs> number two, uh, things not on metadata, there are no gongs, uh, which is to say that every song was worthy of ending with a gong, so it's just kind of an implied gong uh, <laughs> at the end of each song. <laughs> and number one. The thing you will not find on metadata. Bad songs. <laughs> I love it. Well, that just gets me more excited to hear it. So I, if people want to hear it, are you going to release it on streaming the day of the, the release shows? Or are you going to wait? Or are you going to keep it off the No, stream? I think what I'm going to do is give uh, vinyl privilege. So nice. people who come to the shows... We'll have first crack at it. I'll get it out to record stores the next week. And then I think I might, I don't, I don't really know how to do this. It was just an idea I had. Um, Cause these are the only times these songs are going to be performed in any kind of live capacity. So that's, that's going to be it. So to uh, make the event special, I'm going to, I think I'm going to release a song a week streaming after that. And who's going to be part of the <clears throat> band for the shows? Let's see, we've got who's all participating? We've got Alex Drossard, of course, Sam Farrell, of course, Ryan Seafelt, of course, uh, Oliver Anderson will be involved in it, my wife Jackie, and my daughter Susanna uh, will, will all be participating. And then the opening act is going to be uh, largely the, the whole thing is going to be a lot of just. Um, multimedia stuff so <clears throat> the opening act is going to be oliver anderson and alex drossert have made an animation piece with uh some music that alex scored so Very that's cool. going to be the opening act well i can't wait to to see that friday january 26th at the tarleton in green bay 7 p.m i think yeah. the music starts at maybe 8 7 30 7 30 and then late. saturday at the draw in appleton january 27th yeah also want to mention before we end, uh, you did an interview last month with Rooted Wisconsin. Yeah, it was a cool Rooted show. Wisconsin podcast. If people want to, to get even more Maddie Day, you guys talk about some stuff we talked about and then some stuff that we didn't. So mm -hmm. it's go check out Rooted Wisconsin. Good show. And I, I think I'm going to be on um, Into the Music 
next oh, month. Oh, nice. Too. That's a, another. I'm glad you yeah. brought that up. Another great uh, podcast from the area and the music with Rob. And yeah, lots I, of. I really like that show. I really like your show too. So yeah, thanks for having me, man. Yeah. And where can people find out more about Maddie Day? MatthewTDay.com and Instagram MTDay E double M T double E D A Y and Facebook Maddie Day Verified.